What's up guys, Dr. Gooden here to talk about muscular adaptations to anaerobic training, coming up. I'm Dr. Jacob Gooden, professor of kinesiology at Point Loma Nazarene University. And in this video, we are going to talk about muscular adaptations to anaerobic training. In the previous video, we covered the neural adaptations to anaerobic training programs. And so the muscular adaptations, while they do take a little bit longer to begin to notice, they are also important for the long-term development of our athletes. Let's take a look. Okay, this information comes from the Essentials of Strength Training and Conditioning by Drs. Hoff and Triplett, and this chapter was written by Dr. Duncan French. Now, there are three primary ways that a muscle adapts to anaerobic training, and these are by increasing in size, through fiber type transitions, and by enhancing its biochemical and ultrastructural components. And depending on the specific type of anaerobic training that you're doing, these changes result in enhanced muscular strength, power, or endurance. Now there are two ways that a muscle can grow, via hypertrophy or by hyperplasia. <clears throat> now hypertrophy refers to muscular enlargement from an increase in the cross-sectional area of existing muscle fibers. So you take a muscle fiber and you subject it to mechanical tension and to metabolic byproducts of muscular contraction, and it will adapt by creating more myofibrils inside of that muscle fiber. It will jam pack more actin and myosin proteins into that muscle cell. So now there are more contractile elements, it gets larger, that muscle cell expands, it potentially expands beyond its myonuclear domain, so now we have to have satellite cells coming in and donating more myonuclei to that muscle, and now the muscle has a greater capacity for size because it has enough nuclei to control all the goings on inside that now larger muscle cell and that's how hypertrophy happens, right? So we have a remodeling of the muscle so that it enlarges and that it can hold more myofibrils, more actin and myosin so that more cross bridge binding occurs. Hyperplasia on the other hand is an increase in the number of muscle fibers via longitudinal fiber splitting. So hyperplasia, which we've seen in animal models, is the result of a muscle fiber splitting actually into two, and now there's two muscle fibers, not necessarily larger in size. Now that there's two of them, you know, this also results in a greater cross-sectional area of the muscle itself. So either hypertrophy, the fibers get bigger, or hyperplasia, the fibers split, and now there's more fibers packed into that muscle. Now in humans, we have only directly observed muscle hypertrophy. Now, that said, we just haven't observed it happening in humans because it would be unethical to, say, take a muscle and remove it from a human subject and then conduct a bunch of studies on it, okay? And even a muscle biopsy, which I've had before and it, and it hurts and it's no fun to get those, those are uncomfortable and usually you have to have a, a really good reason to take a chunk of somebody's muscle out to study it, okay? So we haven't observed hyperplasia directly in humans. It may happen right, especially in supremely jacked individuals who have reached the end of their myonuclear domain, right, they have really hit their genetic potential for muscle hypertrophy, and then now maybe some, some muscle fiber splitting has to go on, some hyperplasia has to occur to keep getting bigger. We're not sure though. We do know that muscle hypertrophy definitely occurs, and that in most of the athletes that we might be training, and most of the general population clients we might train, hypertrophy is going to be the primary driver of muscle growth. So the key point is that the process of hypertrophy involves an increase in the synthesis of contractile proteins actin and myosin within the myofibril, as well as an increase in the number of myofibrils within a muscle fiber, okay? So we get new myofibrils and those myofibrils have more actin and myosin within them. The new myofilaments are added to the myofibril, resulting in an increase in its diameter. So we get more actin and myosin in the myofibril, we get more myofibrils in the muscle cell. This results in a larger diameter muscle cell. Now we've been talking about fiber size changes, but it's important to note that both type one and type two muscle fibers can increase in their cross-sectional area. However, type two fibers have a greater 
potential for increase in size than type 1 fibers. So even if you have predominantly slow twitch fibers in a muscle, those type 1 fibers, they can still increase in size, they can still hypertrophy. However, type 2 fibers can increase in size to a greater degree. This is why if you have an individual who has a greater percentage of type 2 fibers, they will have a larger window for muscle hypertrophy versus somebody who maybe is more genetically geared towards endurance sports, somebody with more type 1 muscle fibers, they can undergo hypertrophy. They can get bigger muscularly, but they'll never reach the same muscularity as this other individual who has more type 2 muscle fibers. Now there are also what is called fiber type transitions. And this is where we see fibers actually begin to change fiber types. Now it's not necessarily true that we just have type 1, type 2A, and type 2X fibers. There's actually a whole spectrum of fibers as you see here, 1C, 2C, 2AC, etc. And so we see fibers actually transitioning from one type to another along that continuum with training. Now really the majority of changes that we see in fiber type are from the fast twitch, so this is fast, the truly fast, the fast twitch type 2X down the line towards the slow twitch. Now we haven't observed a type 2X fiber changing completely into a type 1 fiber. However, with training, we do see transformations from type 2X to type 2AX and then to type 2A. And then small percentages of those fibers might continue to transition to slower fiber types, but it takes a lot of training to do that. Now the primary driver of these changes is just the volume of work that you are doing with your training. Any muscular contraction will start to bring these type 2X fibers, which are very, very anaerobic. They have very low fatigue resistance. They have a, a very heavy reliance on the raw ATP stores and on the creatine phosphate system. Almost any amount of frequent consistent contraction will bring these fibers down to type 2 AX and type 2 A muscle fibers. Okay, they'll go down the line from the super fast to the sort of fast muscle fibers. And so we have to be careful for our athletes who are in strength and power sports not to subject them to too high of volu volumes of training, at least not all the time, in order to preserve their truly fast twitch muscle fibers. So we don't want to take a very explosive individual with a lot of type 2x muscle fibers and subject them to huge volumes of training all the time. Because what we'll see is, yes, they might get stronger, yes, we might see some neural improvement, but we're also going to see these fiber type transitions. So the actual muscle fibers are less explosive, less anaerobic, more aerobic, more resistant to fatigue, but not able to contract as quickly or as forcefully. And so this individual may not actually improve in their in his or her explosive abilities uh, after a certain point because all their fiber types are starting to, to transition. And this is where things like planned rest or tapers come into play where you dramatically reduce the volume of training, keep the intensity high, but you reduce the volume of training. And maybe we see some of these fiber types start to shift back to their faster forms with that reduction in volume. So we have to be really careful about our volume prescriptions, especially for strength and power athletes. Now there are also structural and architectural changes within the muscle cell. We see that resistance training can increase the myofibrillar volume, cytoplasmic density, and sarcoplasmic reticulum and T-tubule density, and sodium potassium ATPase activity. Now all of these things result in a, in a stronger contraction of that muscle fiber. For instance, we've seen that sprint training can enhance calcium release, we know that calcium is necessary for cross bridge binding to occur. And we've seen that resistance training can increase the angle of pination. Now recall that the angle of pination is the angle of the muscle fiber to the muscle's line of pull. So if this is the line of pull of a muscle, the muscle fibers don't all run in line with that line of pull or with the tendon of that muscle. Different muscles have different arrangements of their fibers and the pination refers to the angle between the alignment of the muscle fiber and the muscle's line of pull. So the, a greater pination allows you to actually pack more muscle fibers into the cross-sectional area of that muscle. So that now you have more sarcomeres in series to contract synchronously and generate more force production. Now a greater angle of pination will also change the velocity characteristics of a muscle. It will actually be a slower velocity of contraction because 
more sarcomeres in series if they all shorten together, results in greater displacement of the muscle fiber so that a greater pronation angle results in fewer sarcomeres in series. So really the interplay between fascicle length, or the length of the muscle fiber, and pronation angle can change the force versus velocity characteristics of a muscle. And we see that sprinters, while they do have hypertrophy and considerable pronation angle, they actually tend to have longer fascicles, whereas somebody like a power lifter or a weightlifter, they have greater pronation angle and maybe shorter fascicles because they favor force generation over velocity of contraction. Now some other things that we see with anaerobic training are reduced mitochondrial density. So mitochondria, of course, the, you know, the powerhouse of the cell, they drive the oxidative system. But if we are always training and relying on the anaerobic system, then the body's going to say, okay, we don't need these expensive mitochondria. Let's get rid of them for, in favor of a other anaerobic adaptations. There may be decreased capillary density, increased buffering capacity, especially if you are training anaerobically in the 10 to 30 second range instead of the zero to 10 second range, and then changes in the muscle substrate content and enzyme activity. Now there are some anaerobic training methods like resistance training that if you do it with high enough volume and with long enough sets, you could actually get increased capillary density and increased mitochondrial density. So for instance, bodybuilders who do giant sets or large sets in the weight room, they will get improvements in mitochondrial and capillary density. Whereas a weightlifter or powerlifter who's sticking to sets of 10 or less, usually less than 10, they may get reductions in those two components. So it really sort of depends in your anaerobic training, how much volume of that training you're doing and how long do the intervals or the sets last. All right, so that wraps it up for the muscular adaptations to anaerobic training. Thanks for sticking with me. If you guys had any questions, let me know down in the comments below. And if you missed it, check out the previous video where I covered neural adaptations to anaerobic training. In the next video, we'll check out connective tissue adaptations to anaerobic training. And until next time, remember to move well, live well, and teach other people to do the same.